Hello fellows and welcome to the channel or welcome back and this is part number four where we're going to continue to work on the MGB GT to get it ready for its track day on the 18th of March. We're going to do a couple of things on this car and those are going to be the last things we need to do and it includes changing the oil in the gearbox, the differential, checking the shock absorbers and the brakes and we're going to actually refill the brake fluid. Although we are preparing in this video the MGB GT for the racetrack, it may have some merit as well for your normal road MGB, uh, especially when we start talking about the gearbox. So in case you have a roadworthy MGB, then just have a look on the chapter where we're changing the oil in the gearbox because there's a lot of debate about changing oil on an MGB gearbox. So with any further ado, let's start on the gearbox. This is the gearbox and you will find a plug on the bottom. This is the plug to drain the oil out of it. And there's another plug a little bit on the side there where you have to fill it up. Now filling it up is easy. Um, you just remove the side plug and you just fill it up until it spills over. I think it's around two and a half liters. Now to undo the bottom plug, you need a spanner 19. And this is a metric one in my case. <clears throat> and just unplug it. Now I already have drained the oil, but if you didn't, then you can just drain the oil and it will just come out. Now let's have a look on the oil itself. That's the oil that came out of my gearbox. And if you look at it, you can see it has like a golden look to it. And that is just because these are small particles from the copper and the brass synchro meshes that are now um, are mixed with the oil. So it is important that you do put the right oil into your gearbox. So now the question arises, what kind of an oil should you use in your gearbox? Well, if your car is a daily driver with a standard engine, then standard engine oil is more than adequate. So a 20W50, like I have here, Castrol XL, is a great oil for your classic car. So by all means, put this in and change it maybe every 25,000 kilometers and you should be really good. You should have no issues. Now, if your car is having a uh, tuned engine with more horsepower, then you're going to put more forces on the gears themselves. So then you might want to resolve to another type of oil, which is a bit better. I mean, because after all, oil is supposed to make sure that the shifting is smooth, but it has to have the right viscosity. Now, if you go into gearbox oil, like I have here, that is typically a 75W90. Now, the viscosity of those two, uh, the 20W50 and the 75W90, is exactly the same. It is just labeled different. Uh, gearbox oil viscosity is not the same as, of course, in numbers as the uh, normal engine oil. Nevertheless, uh, so you can go for standard transmission oil, but be very careful with that. Some of those oils have additives added to it and sulfur is one of those and that will affect the yellow metals inside your gearbox. So the bronze and copper will be affected and you don't want your synchro meshes to wear out. So don't use any GL4-5 or GL5. This is a GL5. This is not what you should be using, but you can use a GL4. This is a GL4 gearbox oil, which will not affect the uh, yellow metals inside your gearbox. So this is what I'm going to use. Uh, the good thing about this one is that it is better for more torque than what you have on standard engine oil. And yeah, it's specifically designed for gearboxes. So this is really working well, and this is what I'm gonna put in mind. I've done it on other cars before. I didn't do it on the MGB GT yet, but I'll let you know for sure. But I know that this is working just fine. So let's put it in. Filling up the gearbox can be a little bit of a tedious job because it's hard to get to. So I didn't use a pump, but I'm using this uh, huge syringe here and it's still dripping a little bit of oil. But this is a syringe that is typically used for AdBlue, but it's perfect. So I'm going to suck up the oil and then I can put the hose inside the opening of the gearbox, which by the way is this size of a bolt. So you can see that just fits properly. So very handy and easy to use, all right? So I'm gonna suck out that one liter. And then we'll fill up the gearbox with it. 
all the way on the top, you can see where the plug is to fill up the gearbox. So I already uh, unlocked it. So here is that oil that we just filled up. I already removed the nut on the side of the gearbox. I'm just going to put the hose inside. And now I'm going to fill it until it spills over. See, now it starts to spill over. It's time to stop. Now it's fully filled up. And now we can plug it back up. All right, so this is done. I'm just going to tighten it up and we should be finished. So the next step is changing the oil in the differential. And for that one, I'm going to use Gearbox Oil SAE90, which is quite thick. And it's also a GL4 for the same reasons as I explained for the gearbox. Now you might need a special socket for that. To drain and fill up the differential, you will have to remove this plug which is inside. There are two plugs, one on the bottom and one on the top. And it has a square hole, so you need a square wrench. And here I created one from an old extension bar that I will use. And I just, you know, grinded it off, make it square so it fits nicely. Now you can also buy these tools, but I don't have them, but this is more than good enough. So on the differential, we've got one plug on the bottom to drain it with the square hole, and then there's another plug right there to fill it back up, just like on the gearbox. So let's undo the oil and see what it does. So this is the tool I was referring to, so... Uh... All right. <laughs> Well, that looks like it's drained, so I'm going to put the plug back. So now let's remove the filler plug. And that's right there. Now the gas tank is in the way for the long extension, so I made myself another one, as you can see. And we're going to use the same tactic. We're going to use this uh, big syringe to fill that up. Now this oil is a lot thicker, so I'm just going to try to pour it in like this first. I'm going to start with one liter. Don't know exactly how much goes in there, but we'll find out. And here we go. Exactly the same way, right? Now this is going to be a tougher action to pump it in because the oil is thicker well, it's a good exercise for the muscles because you really have to push hard on this. There we go. It starts to spill over. It's full. So let's put the plug back in place. So let's have a check on the brakes and in the back I still have big drums as you can see because in the GT class where this car is driving in you cannot change the brakes in the back. You have to keep it as original as possible so that's what we have this these drums are held in place by small screws and sometimes they are hard to get out and i like to use a shock screwdriver to knock these out once they are going you should be good so now we should be able to get the drum off there we go so the lining on the brake pads is still quite all right i think it's still about Let's see, uh, five, six millimeters. So that should be more than good enough. I don't see no abnormal wear and tear. So now we can reassemble this side and then we check the other side. So even the drum looked good at the inside. So that can all go back on. And I took the opportunity to paint it. Uh, I like clean things, so. up and the last thing that needs to go up is the wheel spacer so let's have a look on the front brakes and I'm going to check the brake pads how thick they still are and I still have let's see uh, eight millimeters of um, lining on them so that's good I don't need to worry about that 
and the disc should be no thinner than 11 millimeters. So let's see how much we got here. Uh, the disc is uh, 1325, so we are good. Um, there's not a lot more to be said about this. Uh, the disc is a little bit uh, grooved slightly, but very slightly. Uh, the backside is not. So I think all I need to do is just uh, to change the brake fluid and flush it through. And then we should be good with the brakes in the front, but also in the back. The orange pipe that you see is the intake from the front valance from cold air which is actually blowing onto the brake pads uh, just to keep the disc and the disc itself to keep that a little bit cooler. So, so we're blowing right up here so that keeps the disc a little bit cooler. When I inspected the left rear wheel I noticed that there was a lot of oil around and the brake line liners were also pretty uh, greasy. So those are cleaned up, I probably will replace them, but I suspect that the seal is gone. So I'm gonna try to take this hub off and then see what the issue is. Because the last thing you want is to have oil on your brakes once you're on a racetrack, so. So that went easy. And this should come off very simple. So let's see. I can see that there is oil leaking in the bottom. So that's the seal that needs to go. If you look closely underneath here, you can actually see oil coming out. And this is the oil coming from the differential. It's not that there's too much oil in the differential because we let it all drip out. So it's now level, but this seal is most likely gone. So we'll have to replace the seal and maybe even the color. Now I don't have a seal available, so that will be in a day or two, but I will have to drain again the uh, differential oil. It is what it is. Right, so let's get the oil out of the differential and I'm not gonna waste it. I'm gonna catch it because this is fresh oil. We just put this up, remember? Maybe I should have been smarter and I should have checked the brakes before, but yeah, what can I say, right? It's not a big deal. The thing is, I probably don't need to let it drain completely um, if the level is low enough so it doesn't get into the uh, axles, then it should be okay. I'm gonna put the plug back. And it's easier said than done. There are different ways to get a seal out and sometimes it's easy and sometimes they can be a real pain in the ass. Damage the sides too much, but it is coming out as you can see. And here is the seal. So all I need is a new seal. The edges over here feel a bit sharp. So I'm gonna use the Dremel to smooth that up because when I put the new seal up, I don't want it to be damaged right away. It's gonna slightly deburr the edges. So the good thing is the parts have arrived. I've got the new uprated shock absorbers. I got new brake pads or brake shoes, I should say, and also the missing seals. So now we can put all that stuff back onto the car. So let's get going. Now, as the seals have been leaking for quite a long time, I found a lot of oil on the brake shoes themselves, on the linings. And this lining is now saturated with oil. You can rub it down with uh, abrasive paper, but it's not going to help you because it's all the way inside. So I need to replace as well the brake shoes, and I'm going to do this on both sides. If you look closely on the brake shoes on this car, then you will notice that there is nothing here. This is where normally you would find a bar and a cable which is used for your manual brake. This car doesn't have it because it's intended for the track. So we don't have that one. But for the rest it's the same. So you will have to remove the springs and they can be a little bit tough, especially the bottom one here. But if you remove the top one first, that typically uh, helps you out quite a bit. After you have released these locking pins on both sides, you just push it in and turn it and then that can come loose. And not all that complicated. But if you look closely on the brake shoes themselves, you will notice that there is 
one side with the lining all the way to the end and there's another part or area on the same shoe whereby you have no lining in the beginning. So it's kind of a run-in period. So if you consider the wheel is spinning anti-clockwise if you drive uh, forward, then you should have the kind of a run-in area uh, always first into that direction. Now, these are the new pads that I ordered up. They are exactly the same as you can see. And here you can also see that kind of a run-in area. So remember, if you put the brake pads up, that you do it in the right way, like so. Not like this, because that would be the wrong direction. So keep that in mind. If you wonder why I didn't make a disc conversion on this car in the back to replace these drums, because the efficiency of drums isn't all that good, then the answer for that one is very simple. I am just not allowed because on the track in the class where this car is going to drive, there are regulations that say that you need to keep the brakes original. So that is why you don't see vented discs in the front, although we have a hose venting the discs, but it's not a vented disc as such. We have the original calipers and in the back we have the original drum brakes. That is the reason why. That way you can keep the competition a bit level. Now, there are things we can do, little tricks we are allowed to do, and that is modifying the brake ratio between the back and the front. Uh, one of the things to affect the braking difference between the front and the rear of the car is by changing the diameter or the bore of this little brake cylinder here. That always works, so you can adjust it with different sizes, so the force on braking is more or less. This is what we do, and this is something you need to experience on the track and find out what you need to do with this. But okay, enough of that, now we're going to install actually the seal. Installing the new seal isn't all that complicated. Making sure everything is clean, that there is no uh, sharp edges that could damage the rubber, and also this insert here, make sure that the, that is intact. If it's grooved, then you have to change it, otherwise you will lose oil uh, on this conic part as well. So I just make sure everything is cleaned up properly. Here's our seal, and I like to put some grease on the inside. Not too much, just a little bit, so it slides on properly. And a little bit on the outside. I'm going to try to push it in gently. Now, to get it further in, I have a little tool here, which is a piece of a plumbing system, but it has a nice neck or color. And I can put this on there and then knock that in gently. Uh, you can use whatever you like to use for that, but this for me has always worked. So the first thing I'm going to do is to unlock the brake pads by rotating this. Uh, it's very simple. You just push it down a bit and then you rotate it. And these are the two little things that come out. I'm just going to put that aside. Do the same thing on this side. You push and rotate, and you can see it is actually slotted. There we go. Sometimes you might have to hold the back, but in general, that's quite all right. If the uh, stuff is still in a good condition, of course. So now you almost can move these pads around, as you can see, right? So you might be able to pull them out from the top, which makes it easier for that top spring to be released. And you've seen that the spring is actually in the back. Now, if you're not sure about where the spring is supposed to go, then you can always use a marker and then mark it up where it should be. And now we can remove easily the bottom part. So that was very easy on this car, wasn't it? Uh, but that's just because there is no manual brake. Uh, I'm going to clean this up now. So this is part of the uh, brake adjustment. This is used to adjust the brake shoes and uh, there is an insert like so where the brake shoe fits into and this goes actually in here. And there is two of them, one on the other side as well. Now in the back there is a screw that you can turn in and it will push these metal pieces out. You'll see that. So let me just turn it and, and watch this side here. You see it's coming out. And this is on how you're going to adjust it. 
and it works in both ways also on the other side uh, so I always like to have this mechanism double checked and greased and cleaned uh, each time I change my brake pads here they are the new brake pads I'm just going to slide them on the cylinder in the bottom first and then I'm going to connect them up and that's where they should sit and remember what I explained to you before the run-in area is on the top so always in the direction of the wheel going forward so it would be like this and we can put back these small pieces from the back that need to come through and you might want to hold those once you put everything back together these things are a little bit tricky to put up sometimes uh, but at the end you will succeed and now my hands are really cold uh, because it's about one degree centigrade here and the metal is cold so you don't have a lot of feeling to adjust the brake shoes that the brake drum fits properly you need to rotate a square rod in the back of that adjuster now to do that you're gonna need a square socket or something like that and I don't have it but uh, I have here a standard socket uh, and I'm going to use this one with a bolt and a couple of nuts so I can put this together like this and this square part will fit perfectly onto that rod and then on the other side I'm just using another socket and now I can rotate this very easily so this is what I'm going to do right now here is that piece so I'm just going to stick it on there and then we can start rotating it now I've set them to the minimum right now so I'm going to open them up and you can see if I rotate that the shoes are opening up right so this is something I will need to adjust once the drum is on but before I put the drum on I need to put the hap up first so let's do that the torque on the nut is 150 pound feet and as you can see it's set up for 150 or 203 newton meters so I'm going to tighten that up so I'm going to block that with a bar because otherwise you can't tighten that nut there we go now it might be that the split pin isn't going to fit and I'm lucky it just fits but if it doesn't fit you turn it back a bit so now we can put the drum back on and I've cleaned out the drum entirely at the inside because that was a bit greasy now putting the drum up uh, might need a little bit of fiddling around with the brake shoes because they may not be fully centered so keep that in mind and also make sure that the adjustment is all the way to the minimum all right let's see if we can get it on you know you can feel this is now rotating freely one of the things i'm going to do now is lock them first here with these special screws and then we will actually um, push the brakes once to get everything in place and see how it feels then. and then we will adjust the back nut to get these brake shoes open a bit so that the drum is not stuck but it's almost touching the brake shoes but not fully because otherwise if it touches it it's gonna run hot the metal will expand and your brakes will seize so now with all that installed I'm going to center the brake shoes so therefore I'm just going to depress the brakes and then they should open up and they will center themselves around the drum the distance between the brake lining and the drum might not be optimum yet but at least they will be both in the proper location right so that has happened let's feel you feel this is still very loose so now we need to adjust that brake in the back our little tool that we made uh, for the adjustment so uh, let's see if we can get these brakes locking up first ok 
Okay, probably need to turn the other way. Yep. See now, we're starting to have some friction. Even more now. If I turn a bit more, you can feel that the lining of the brakes are really uh, pushing against the drum. Of course, that is no good, so we go back a little bit until it just touches. So now the drum is not really rubbing over it, but it's very close to it. And this is what you want to have. Now the best thing to do now is to put the wheels on and take the car for a test ride and then check it again and see, feel if the drums are getting warm. If they do get warm, then you have an issue actually uh, with that alignment and you have to uh, get them more inwards. So this is all what you need to do on the drum brake. So not really complicated. So this side is ready. Now I'm going to do the other side. The drum brakes on the side of this car don't have an issue. I don't have an oil leak and the brake shoes are not spoiled by oil. But still, it is good common practice to replace brake shoes on both sides if you're changing brakes. Same thing with brake pads, you're always changing them in pairs. So this is what I'm going to do. And I'm also going to replace that seal here. Although it's not necessary, I'll still do it. So let me do this and then we come right back to something else about the shock absorbers. The next thing we're going to do is to replace the shock absorbers and the ones that are on the car in the back, at least one of them is leaking a bit. So I needed to replace them anyhow. And I'm taking the opportunity to replace them with reconditioned versions, uh, which are up rated. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says it's upgraded to 30%. So they are far more stiff, better for the racetrack. And you're probably going to wonder now why I'm not fitting the normal standard telescopic convert. Um, shock absorbers. Well, the reason for that is very simple. It is not allowed in the regulations, so I need to stick with the old traditional versions. Now, some of those uh, you can actually adjust. I've seen them, whereby you can here have an adjustment to make them more soft or more hard. Now, I don't have that one. I might fit this later, but right now I'm going to go with what I have and we're going to install it in a few seconds. So, let's start. Now, I'm using an uh, axle support to change the uh, shock absorbers, but you don't need to do this. You can also use a normal jack and lift it up underneath the springs. It all works. I'm just doing it here because I have this axle stand. The shock absorber is right there, and there's two bolts. There's one bolt here, there's a bolt on the other side, and then is the arm going down to the uh, spring. So, these are the bolts we need to undo. That's number one. Here is our new shock absorber. All right. So that should fit more or less. So all I need to do now is to bolt it down. So the next thing we're going to do is to bleed the brakes or change the brake fluid. And therefore, I like to use this kind of a pressure container. Inside the container, we've got brake fluid. And I'm using DOT4 on this race car, but it depends on yours. And then uh, you have compressed air from your compressor, which comes in on the side here that will put pressure in this tank. And then um, with this connector right here, you have an adapter that is going on top of your um, brake fluid container. You hook it up, you secure it, and then you can set the pressure. And 40 PSI should be more than enough. So if I now open up the valves, then the brake fluid will come out and it will fill up the brake set of water and keep pressure on it. At the same time, you release the nipples on the brakes and that way uh, you don't need to pump all the time on the foot pedal because that's a tedious job to do. And with this, you can do the job on your own. So let me start. So that's now all hooked up and the valve is closed. So as soon as I have the tubes on the nipples, I will open up this valve and then we can bleed the system. I finished bleeding the brakes and all what I need to do now is put the wheels on and take it for a test spin because the MGB GT is ready to hit the track. 
However, I still owe you something. You might have seen on my channel that I have a lot of videos on Weber carburetors. To take them apart, to reassemble them, to inspect them, to baseline them, how they work and so on. In fact, I even have two videos on how to tune them uh, on the idle and the progression. But what I haven't provided to you yet is the tuning of the Weber carburetor at its normal main circuitry or at the acceleration. And the only way you can do this is on a rolling road or basically on a racetrack. And I'm going to take the MGB GT to the racetrack and there we're going to start changing the jets on the Milson tube, the air correction jet, but also the main fuel jet where necessary. And we'll see while we drive on the track what we need to change. Um, right now it runs quite smooth. But that doesn't mean anything because it is without a load and an engine without a load doesn't tell you really nothing. So I'll see you on the track next time. Bye bye.